It's great to be here. We're going to talk about handling stress. All right, we got some stress right there. I'd say the horse has got fear stress. The man probably has pain stress. I don't know about the steer, but the, that picture's not photoshopped. That is absolutely for real. Okay, pain, fear. One of the problems we got was sheep, and I understand you got a lot of people here interested in shape. Sheep is the ultimate prey species. And when you're watching, they don't show you that they're hurting. They cover it up. Cattle cover it up too, but not as much as sheep do. And uh, now you take the lamb away from mama, you hear ba 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 ba, but that's separation distress. And on Panskep's neuroscience, separation distress is a different emotion and, than just fear and, and pain. Sheep covered up, cattle covered up too. And so you want to find out well, the behavior related with pain in sheep and cattle. You better have video cameras, remote video cameras. I had an interesting experience with um, cattle. I was out at a feed yard and they were um, doing some band castrating of heavy bulls and I was hiding inside the scale house but I could see where the cattle came out. They didn't know I was in that scale house and one of these uh, animals laid down and moaned, rolled on the ground moaning. I come out of that scale house, he jumped up like everything was normal. Okay, that's the most well, very important thing with the ruminants. They cover up the fact they're hurting. I've gone into places where they're doing some very invasive stuff to shape. And they go, oh, they're absolutely fine. They're not in pain. I said, you better put video cameras on them at night and find out what they're doing. Because I don't think that's going to be true. All right, here's some no fear handling. And I am a very, very big proponent of training animals to cooperate with procedures, whatever it is. And a basic principle is, the more flighty the animal is, and we worked at the Denver Zoo with training antelopes, we had to go through a very long habituation period to train them to tolerate stuff like a sliding door opening. That took 10 days, where domestic cattle, I'd probably train that in about three days. And because the thing is, if I scare them early in the training, They'll be afraid of things. I just talked to somebody just last night. They had a nine-month-old puppy, loved to go out on the boat, but he fell in the water. And he, for the rest of the dog's life, he's terrified of water. It's really important that animals' first experiences with new things need to be at least neutral experiences. Another basic principle, very basic, calm animals are easier to handle. So let's say you do have a big wreck and the animal's all crazy. Put it back in its pen, let it calm down for half an hour. Just let it calm down for half an hour. Very simple thing that you can do. Okay, calm animals, nice soft brown eyes. Now the first thing that starts to happen is you scare the poop out of them. Now, I could say something else, but you scare the poop out of them. All right, in our cattle, our horses, all our grazing animals, Okay, sheep usually don't have a tail, but the cattle and the horses, they swish their tail. Eye white. You got eye white showing, you got a really scared animal. Ears pinned back. It kind of starts with the poop first. That's the first thing that you'll see when they're getting scared. And Mr. Bison, he puts his tail up. Well, there's a dog there with what um, Patricia McConnell calls whale eye. And animals tend to associate something bad with something they were seeing or hearing the moment it happened. Maybe it's white lab coats. Maybe something as simple as getting rid of the lab coat solved the problem. Watch your body language. See how the horse and zebra have an ear on each other? These animals have very mobile ears. They watch with their ears. What I want to do is to get you a whole lot more observant. Be observant. I also want to get you away from language. In many of my books, like Animals in Translation, I have talked about you know, how autism helped me understand animals because I'm a visual thinker. Now, some people have kind of distorted that and making me say that animals are autistic. No, there's two different things in animal behavior. There's the cognitive component. How does it think and store its memories? That's going to be sensory-based. Like an elephant that was terrified of diesel-powered equipment but everything that ran with a gasoline engine was fine. That's very specific, that's cognitive. 
I'm going to show you some other examples. Emotions, that's something totally different. Well, if you look at Jack Penskep's research, the emotional drivers in most mammals are the same. You know, so where it's similar to autism is on the cognitive side, the cognitive side, not the emotional side. You know, when you look at things like bird migration, that's kind of a savant-like skill. He's very upset there. You know, and if you don't use nose tongs, you know, if you've got to handle cattle, uh, please don't use nose tongs. They hurt. You've got to hold the head. Use a halter. Don't force it. All right, let's show you some good reasons why you shouldn't be forcing animals. This is not a nice experiment. It was done with pigs. And basically, the aggressive handling, they ran them around the barn, and they shocked them a bunch of times with electric prods, and the gentle handling moved them quietly. Look at the differences there in those lactates. 25 versus 4. And some people might think that 25 was a normal reading. That's not a normal reading. Glucose, 215 versus 80. You know, huge, huge, big differences. And when I first started working with Nancy Earlback on training antelopes at the Denver Zoo, all of the um, cortisol measures were like 20 and 30. Well, we managed to get like 8 and 9 single digits. You see, people thought those real high values were normal cortisols. Uh -uh. They were stressed out cortisols. And a lot of people didn't want to admit it. Yes, they have emotions. This part of the animal is definitely not autistic. I was reading some stuff the other day where some people were kind of misrepresenting some of the, my stuff. It's the cognition that's more like autism. Cognition, thinking, thinking, memory storage. Prozac works on dogs. And the neurotransmitters are the same. Well, this is Jack Penskep's core emotions. I'm not going to be going through everything on this. But one of the important things is Fear and separation distress are two separate things. You see that shape? He's pain, scared, he doesn't show it. But you take the lamb away from mama, they're, they're ba 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 going crazy. Or you get a lone sheep, maybe in your lab, off of, from the other sheep, it's going ba 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 ba. That's separation anxiety. I don't like Panskep's word panic. I hate that word panic because that gets mixed up with fear. I'd rather say fear and then separation distress. The other thing interesting in talking about emotions is for years this research has shown they have emotions, but it was all hidden in the neuroscience literature. Veterinarians and animal scientists avoided these words. It's only been in the last few years they've started using them. These experiments are old. Seeking, that's what makes an animal go out and explore things. You know, you've got some labs that want to just uh, chase the ball all the, t all, the all the time. Other dogs care less about it. And then, of course, you got sex, so we call that lust, so Net Nanny doesn't censor our web searches. Um, you've got the oxytocin system, mother, young, caring, and you've got play. You know, you can, what are some of the nasty things animals can have? They can have fear, stress, separation, anxiety, um, pain, and then you can get physical stresses. You're hot, you're cold, tired, whatever. All right. Animals will self-medicate for pain. People say to me, oh, well, I can't feel any pain. These, to me, are the gold standard experiments. You provide either two feeders or two water bowls, artificially mess up the joint, the chicken or the rat, and I don't remember what they injected into it, but something very nasty, and they'll drink this horrible, bitter-tasting stuff, and then as they heal, they'll move away from that. So they're not getting addicted to it. And this to me tells me, yeah, they definitely do feel pain. And these, this is work that needs to be done in fish, hasn't been done yet. Okay, animals, you know, like dogs, for example, need social. The most important thing you can do for dogs that are in the kennel is every day to take them out for 45 minutes and have a good play time with people, other dogs. Uh, Krista Coppola, one of my PhD students, um, did this really simple experiment over at the Greeley Animal Shelter and every other dog. Okay, controls just got stuck in the kennel, you know. And the experimentals got to have fun time training and play with Krista. And the next day, this is salivary cortisols, they were lower. But you've got to keep doing it. We've got our paper in physiology and behavior on this. Dogs need this social stuff. This is why we got so much problems with dogs home alone, just chewing up the house and everything. And there's genetic differences in the strength of things like how fearful an animal is. Genetic differences in the strength of how 
uh, the seeking behavior. Let's look at our Labradors. They're like two different breeds of dog. One's a ball crazy skinny lab chasing the ball. The other's a heavy set lazy lab that's just great for service dog. That's differences in seeking. You can genetically select for these traits. In fact, I've just revised my book, Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals. We just came out with a new revision, Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals, Temple Grandin. And um, actually, some of the chapters are available online. If you just search with my name, Science Direct, if you've got a good Elsevier uh, subscription at your institution, you can probably get into some of those chapters. Uh, 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 Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals, second edition. And it's a book. Um, there's some, some people have like taken the title. And there's some journal articles out there that are not mine. And this is a book, it's not a journal article. Okay, um, you know, there are things like pressure wraps. So they actually help calm dogs down. And I just worked with a dog behaviorist and we found that, um, I, yeah, this did have some calming effect. And it reduced the uh, time the dog just spent staring at the door. All right. Emotions are real. Yeah, stimulate the you know, amygdala, it, you get the reactions. You're probably aware of these old experiments. Um, you get through this, you know, yeah, they really do have emotions. This is, look at how old this research is. One of the problems we've got in science is people are in their silos. This has all been over in the neuroscience literature. And, it's, and it's, even two years ago, I was working on some guidelines for veterinarians, and I, I was not allowed to use the fear word. I had to take the fear word out and call it agitation and excitement. All right, this is a basic principle this slide shows. And the basic principle is, is when you force animals to do stuff. And just the other day, I read about some awful video jamming a primate into a chair. Ah, uh ah. -uh. When animals voluntarily cooperate, I don't care what animal you got, then you don't get all this fear stress. I've had wildlife biologists say, oh, we held this otter down for just 15 seconds. It can't be that stressed. Well, let's say I go out to my car this afternoon and somebody knocks me over and steals my purse. That might take 15 seconds, but I'd be really stressed over that. You see, that's fear stress. And this interacts with genetics. The more flighty the genetics is, when you force it, you get more fear stress. Okay, up there at the top there, you got the cortisol levels, really roughed up beef cattle. Then you got beef cattle quiet handling. Dairy cows are trained. And look at our trained antelope down there, the untrainable animal. Worked with Nancy Erlbeck, we got them trained. Go in a box, get blood samples, get um, vaccinated. And it took 10 days to train them just to tolerate a door opening. 10 days of habituation. We hadn't gotten to the operant conditioning yet. Well, the first day, move the door this much, the sliding door, and it goes, shh, and it orients. That's all we did that day. Because when it orients, then the brain makes a decision. Do I keep watching, or do I throw a giant fit and go splat against the wall? OK, the second day, I move the door this much, shh, and it orients. That's all I do. It took 10 days to train it to that door. Once it was trained, I could just jerk the door open. But in a very flighty animal, if you do it too fast, you may never get them trained. And there are antelopes. We're Nyellas and our bongos. We've got papers in zoo biology on this. And um, this was considered to be something impossible. I was looked at like I was a fruitcake when we did this back in the mid-90s. Now everybody does it. And the thing that's really nice is look at those cortisol levels, single-digit cortisols. And we left them in there for 20 minutes. I wanted to make sure it had plenty of time to get up. 20 minutes we left them in there. And you know what happened when I submitted the paper to one of the journals? The title was Low Stress Blood Sampling of Bongos. Somebody wrote that the title was judgmental. And we had to send it to a different journal. They didn't like the fact that what they were calling normal values was like 20 and 30 stressed off the wall. OK, acclimating animals to handling. I mean, this is something in the last few years. Cattle people are doing this on ranches. Um, pigs are easier to handle. Let me tell you, pigs don't like new kind of flooring. If you've got piglets, and they've been raised on a plastic floor, and then you try to drive them out of the pen onto a concrete floor, they won't go. One of the best ways 
to prevent that problem is give those piglets a chance to explore the new floor. Let them explore it for half an hour. Then they will go. You see, if this, you just force them into a novel situation, they get scared. The farmers have learned that if they acclimate their animals to people walking through them, they'll be calmer. Another thing about pigs, they differentiate between a person in their pen and a person in the alley. And you can have a situation where when you're walking in the alley, they're real gentle and calm, and you go in the pen and they're freaking out and they're climbing up the walls. But think about it. See, this gets back to visual thinking. Man in the alley or lady in the alley is different than lady or man in the pen. You want to get those young piglets, when you get some young piglets, get them used to people walking through them. Because animal thinking, since it's sensory based, is extremely specific. Animal memories are extremely specific. For example, with the cattle, if they got habituated to the rancher coming out in his pickup truck and feeding them range cubes, that didn't transfer to the handling facility. Then they brought them up to the handling facility and did a little forcing and freak out over that. If you habituate a horse to a blue and white umbrella, that doesn't instantly transfer to other novel objects. Think about it. It's a different picture. This is a really important thing. And in the um, in lab, I'm, I uh, talked to one, uh, they, they'd had a bunch of beagles in this lab, and something bad had happened, and the animal associated the badness with just seeing a syringe. Well, then they just started hiding the syringe so the dogs didn't see it, and then they were fine. It wasn't the needle stick they were getting upset about. It was seeing the syringe, because the animal tends to associate something it was looking at or hearing right the moment something bad happens. So you get a fear memory. It's either a sound or a picture. And sometimes they'll make odd associations. Like dogs would get afraid of the place they were hit by a car. We wouldn't do that. And one difference between our brain and the dog is we've got a lot more association cortex. Animal thinking specific because it's sensory based, not word based. This is the thing that is more like autism. The emotions will imply the animal is like you know, is emotionally autistic? No, absolutely not. I am strictly here talking about cognition, not emotions. Now the thing is, is then the animal gets one of these specific fear memories. Yeah, you get a big emotion there of fear. So if you can figure out what's setting an animal off, sometimes it's something as simple as maybe white lab coats are bad. Or somebody else has got, um, the, uh, the ruminants do not see red. They see blue, yellow, and green just fine. Um, you know, striped sweater there somebody's wearing, or a scrub suit that's, uh, you know, maybe, maybe blue scrub suits are bad. Well, when you change the color of the scrub suit, they might be just fine about it. Now, this is a, a picture a young man sent to me to show how he thinks in movies in his head. And I think in pictures. And I think this helped me figure out some of this stuff on these fear memories. An animal's first experience with you, a vehicle, or a place needs to at least be a neutral first experience. Because if the first experience is terrible, they don't forget it. Let me tell you about Miller's rats in a radial arm maze. This is an old experiment, and I have a paper called Assessment of Stress During Handling and Transport. It's free download. Assessment of Stress during handling and transport. You can look it up online. And what Miller did is he had a radial arm maze and he puts the rat in the middle of the maze in the, in the hub and it goes down this alleyway. And it finds some chocolate chips. Well, it's gonna keep going down that alleyway. Then it goes in the second alleyway and it gets blasted with an electric shock the first time it goes in. He'll never go in that arm again. Then the, th then the third arm, he goes down there and gets some chocolate chips. And then he's learned that that's the chocolate chip alley. Then he goes in and he gets a tiny tingle shock. And he goes, oh, those chips are good. So he goes on in. And then they gradually increase the shock. And he'll go in for a blasted out shock. But if that big fat shocks the first time he goes in the arm, he's never going to go in there again. It's a really important principle. So maybe you get some new animals in. Let's feed them. Get some you know, new sheep in, let's feed them, let's uh, make sure they have non-slip flooring. I can't emphasize enough the importance of non-slip flooring. 
animals freak out and panic when they start to slip. This horse was terrified of black cowboy hats because during a procedure, they threw alcohol in his face. And the guy who did that was wearing a black hat. White hats are fine. Another thing that shows just how specific this is, is when the hat was on the ground, I could actually get the horse to touch it. But then as I took this hat and I brought it closer to my head, then it got more and more scary. Now, some people may say to me, this is just all anecdotal. But one of the problems is, is to actually prove some of these things. Now, the, the horse experiment did prove it somewhat. You have to like be scaring animals in a really nasty way. It's not something I want to do. Now, they, I know several dogs where men with beards are bad. Another, real, another common one, very common one with dogs is guys are bad. As a guy is more likely to, you know, to abuse the dog. You know, maybe ladies with long hair are bad. They tend to associate some obvious trait. Animals make categories. Like when I'm on the leash, I protect my owner. Off the leash, I play. They make these kind of, you know, specific categories. A common one with cattle is a man on the horse is safe. So maybe they only have a flight zone of, you know, like that, six feet. But when the man gets on the ground, the cattle run away. Think about it. I want to get you really getting away from language. Man on the horse is a different picture than a man on the ground. Now there is, a, I want to just explain how this can kind of generalize in a visually specific way. Uh, I knew this little red dog and she was terrified of hot air balloons. You know, one had come over the house, revved up the burner, scare her, and then she started getting afraid of other things around town like street lights and a gasoline tanker. And I got to thinking, well, well, maybe it's just round stuff she doesn't like. And then I got to thinking, very specific, well, stoplights are round. The globe lights at the pizza parlor are round. Why isn't Red Dog afraid of that? And then I started comparing, in my mind, the very specific pictures. And it turned out it was, it was round against the sky. Because when she got scared of the gas tanker, the red was in the car looking out the front window, and as a gas tanker went up over the top of the hill, it was round the back end, round against the sky. Traffic lights are round against black rectangle. Street lights are round against the sky. Pizza parlor, round against a brick wall. Okay, you see how I'm like very specifically, very visually specific, specific but she generalized in a visually specific way. Another thing I can't emphasize enough is non-slip flooring on the exam table. You know, I don't, if you go on the, online and you look up cute pictures of dogs at the veterinarian, they're all braced like this. You know, give them a non-slip surface. Rapid movement. Okay, sheep, cattle, all those animals, they get scared of rapid movement unless you have specifically habituated them to it. Rapid movement makes the predator chase, it makes the prey run away. Now this is a camera that's used in the movies that moves very slowly like this. You can put that right down around the head of farm animals, they don't even notice it. All right, look for distractions in the environment. I wouldn't want to be galloping my horse down this road because I'm going to end up dumped off. Your animal doesn't want to cross a drain in the lab or you're changing from two different types of flooring material. Give the animal a chance to look at the drain. Don't just force it up there over it. Give it a chance, put its head down, and take a little look. And that, and, or give it a chance to explore. Maybe in the lab you can open up the pen and let the animal explore the floor before you force it. But anything that's like looks different now this is cattle, chains hanging down in chutes. And, and these, these kinds of things are especially a problem the first time you bring the animal into that facility. If you have really well-trained animals, they're going to walk right through the chain. They're going to walk right over the train. But the new animal coming in, he's going to stop at it. And their depth perception's poor. So they have to stop and put the head down. Non-slip flooring, this is a very nice tire mat. Um, it's used in commercial feed yards, a bit difficult to clean. Uh, now we're going to see how your powers of observation are. How many people, now be honest now, saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam? 
Well, we got to do better than that. I deliberately got the slide fixed so it doesn't say anything about the sunbeam. Talking about flooring. This is the kind of stuff I want you to try to like get away from language and think about. Now, look at that right there. He's real cute, but he's in the brace position. I can find and go on the Google Images, and you'll find lots of pictures of that. You know, that's the first experience at the vet office, and they're slipping around on the floor. I tell them the vet students because they don't want to have the have the client when they get a new puppy buy a bath mat that has a rubber backing, get the dog all used to that, then bring that in and put their puppy on the mat, and then they can take it home when the vet doesn't have to clean it. That's the way I tell it to the vet students. Behavior principles of restraint. This applies to every animal. Sudden jerky motion scares. There's also an optimal pressure. I talked to a lady who was really good at handling rats. She'd just pick them up, and she didn't go and she didn't have any big gloves on, they didn't bite her. And she held them with just the right amount of pressure, and she wasn't picking them up by the tail, she was just holding them around the body, and they did not bite her. Another principle is, do not trigger the fear of falling. Okay, Linda Pena Pino is gonna be here later this morning. Her sling works really well because it completely supports the pig. And there's no tendency of the pig to topple in that. So you don't get the fear of falling. But you trigger that fear of falling, that makes animals just get really scared. Here's some extreme fear behavior. Horse spooks at flags in the wind, something new. I've had people say to me, oh, my steer was fine at home, and he went ballistic at the show. But you got a lot of scary stuff there. Flags, bikes, balloons. Yeah, you better get him used to that before he goes there. Also, it's really important that the people that supply some of these animals get them habituated to different things. I went into a research lab that had a lot of beagles on it, and I, they had beagles there from two different suppliers. And beagles from one supplier were totally crazy when you went up there, and the beagles from the other supplier were a lot calmer. Well, the place with the crazy beagles hadn't done any work with them to socialize them. Okay, so you're getting sheep from some place. You might want to get some sheep where people have spent time walking amongst them, maybe have taken them and walked them through the chutes, so when they got to start doing some stuff, they don't get so freaked out over it. And ideally, they'll maybe get the same kind of shoot system you have at the lab and train them to that before you even get them. New experiences. New experiences are attractive when the animal voluntarily approaches. And they're scary when you shove it in their face. And this is where you have an interaction with genetics. You take your flighty animal, your Arab horse, if I put a flag out on the pasture, the Arab will walk up to it first. But it's going to be the first animal to have a great big huge fear uh, uh, you know, response if you shove it in their face. I call that the paradox of novelty. Novelty is both scary and attractive. I put a um, clipboard with paper on it down to pen a cattle, they come up to it. When the wind flips the paper, they run away. And when I first did this, I go, it's like a switch, alternating back and forth between fear and approach. It turns out that it is a switch. The switch has been discovered. I was very interested to find this paper. And some of this research I reviewed with Nancy Earlbeck and Cheryl Morris um, in a paper that's in the journal Animal Science. It's called Companion Animal Symposium um, Environmental Enrichment for a companion zoo and laboratory animals. The easiest way to find it is to go to PubMed, type in Grandin T. You all know PubMed has to be last name and then the initial. And you can find it on a PubMed database. You will not find it on Science Direct. Um, and, and I thought, I went back and I dug up all the old literature and I also found this. And the brain can either go into seek mode or fear mode, sort of a biochemical teeter totter. See, that explains that when my antelope oriented, I knew not to push them past that orienting phase because they'd go splatting against the wall. And I'll give you another example of how specific they were. Our trained antelope uh, were absolutely fine with lots of different people, but when the roofers came to fix the roof, they hit the fence. Another thing we learned, and this is another important thing, the veterinarian who had been the dart gun man could never work with them. You could bring all kinds of strange people in off the street, 
but the dark gun man was evil. And it didn't matter with how you dressed him. It didn't matter if he didn't speak. They knew him. I know this is kind of a nasty thing, but if the animals had gotten a really bad fear memory with a certain person, unfortunately, it's going to be better for that person not to work with them. And that's not in the paper because it was very difficult for the veterinarian who was a co-author to kind of accept that. <laughs> now, I always get asked, are animals afraid of getting slaughtered? Well, these are the places where I first started out. And you can see with that pen there, those cattle actually could jump out of there really easily, but they don't. The behavior was the same in both places. I'm not going to say it's stress-free. It's not. But the, the cortisol levels and the behavior were about the same in both places. You know, and a lot of the stress at the slaughter plants, fear of novelty. It's like bringing that horse into that sail barn, and it's just rearing and going berserk. Now, again, on specific thinking, this is on the movie set. Okay, this was done in a real cattle operation. You see all the cattle out on pasture? Those cattle were attracted to all the vehicles and equipment, and they came forward to watch. This red heifer right here is a trained show heifer, and they wanted me to get a publicity picture with this trained show heifer. And so I knelt down. The heifer was getting ready to lick me, and the next thing I know, she was rearing up and jumping on top of me, and I turned around, and there were reflector boards that they use for the lighting. And they, and they move the reflector board really sudden like that. And I said, don't move it. Then the, then the next time he moved it, I was swearing. <laughs> now, the mistake that was made, the movie set had a lot of white box trucks. And they assumed that since the heifer was fine with white box trucks, she'd be fine with these things. And the one that she was scared of was a 4 by 8 white piece of styrofoam. That's all it was. But the thing is, it doesn't move like a box truck. Trucks tell you they're coming. They move in a much more controlled way. You see, this is a really good example of just how specific that thinking is. Because that heifer had been exposed to everything on that movie set. Tons of equipment, tons of people. She was fine. But she hadn't been exposed to a fast-moving reflector board. OK, what's old home for one animal? is scary for another. Here's bulls living amongst all the whirly gigs. But when I opened the car door, they ran away. That was something novel. Here's a pig living in a very nice place with lots of um, corn stalk bedding. Why is the pig eating the plastic booty? Because it's novel. It's attraction to novel. Only visitors wear plastic booties. They don't get that many visitors. So plastic booties is a gigantic, great, big, interesting novelty. So getting back to environmental enrichment, one of the things that's really important is, having, is changing things. I heard a really interesting story about a primate that was self-injuring herself. And the way they finally um, got that stopped was they put trail mix in, in the puzzle feeder thing. And like on Monday, she'd pull out the green M&Ms. Another day, she'd pull the nuts out. And she'd pick something different each day to pull out just because it was different. And then she stopped cutting herself. OK, these cattle didn't get scared of much because they're around all kinds of activity. And you better get them used to flags before you bring them in. Now, this is another principle. When you force animals to do stuff, and this is not something that I approve of, but the animal that has the less fearful genetics often will habituate better to something that's forced than the animal with the really flighty genetics. You know, in, um, in, in uh, you know, veterans, you know, they take veterans that have get post-traumatic stress syndrome. Not every veteran exposed to the same bad situation gets it. You see, some people get more scared than others. And I can relate to that because I've been on antidepressants for years to control the fear. Turned out my amygdala was three times bigger than normal. Well, here's a heifer that somebody tied up to a fence the trainer, and she went bad. They tried the forceful training method. It didn't work with her. You see, a Holstein's really calm. You tie a Holstein up, they pull back, and they go, oh, a little scared, get over it. More flighty animal doesn't get over it. I'm not a fan of forcing animals to do stuff. But when you get away with it, it tends to be with the genetics where it's less flighty genetics. You know, that's just a habituating little colt, just gently. And 
remember, when you're working with animals, don't pat this is hitting. Stroke it and don't do tickle touches. Tickle touches are alerting. Okay, that's a temperament. Um, you know, some animals have got differences in temperament. The cattle industry for the last 20 years now has been selecting animals for temperament. Calm animals that are weight gain. Yeah, but don't overdo it. You'll have trouble. Like maybe uh, more susceptible to illness. Never overselect for a single trait. Something bad is going to happen. All right, we'll show you Belyev's foxes. Got a whole chapter on this in the genetics book. In fact, in the new um, Genetics and the Behavior of Domestic Animals, they got a whole chapter by Belyev's student. They've continued the fox experiments. So, okay, you got Mr. Snarly here. Bite your hand off if you put your hand in his cage. So they started selecting for gentle foxes that wouldn't rip your hand off. And after about 20 generations, they got a black and white, stocky, border collie fox dog. See, look at the difference in the shape of the animal, too. You're just selecting for temperament. And they kept doing this, and then you got epilepsy. You say you overdid it. It was fine up until a point, but then when you overdid it, then you start to get defects. Overselect for any single trait, you're going to get problems, like um, excitable temperament. When the industry went into lean line pigs, they got pigs that bit tails. OK, we're trying to social house animals. Oh, there are certain genetic lines of commercial pigs that are not fit for social housing. I'll tell you that right now. Now the industry is starting to weed those pigs out. They were also were super lean and had white hockey puck for loin. Um, but they're just very aggressive. Now nobody deliberately would select domestic pigs to be aggressive. It was an accident. It was a linked trait. And the companies like Murphy Brown that have successfully gone to group housing, they had to get rid of that genetics. There's just some genetics of a of, of pig, of the regular domestic pig, is not fit for group housing. The nasty fighters. And then another thing you uh, can have is uh, individuals. It's real nasty. And of course, you all know mix on neutral territory, but there's some, I call them almost criminal animals that you have to, you just, that just isn't going to work. And we are over selecting farm animals. Produce, produce, produce. There's some signs we're getting lower disease resistance. We got pigs now that they're putting biohazard HEPA filters on the windows. Try to keep the germs out, but it's not working. Look at the layer. She's nice and pretty when she's young. That's what she looks like when she gets old. Nervous wreck that loses all her feathers. See, this hen is putting so much into her eggs that when they get old, 20, 50 percent have osteoporosis and broken bones. See, this is pushing that biology just too hard. Look at the difference in the body shape here between an egg layer, slender, the brown one, and the white plump thing. That's the, um, uh, the, the regular the broiler. And the leg conformation issues. We're selecting certain production traits. Then we started getting leg conformation problems in pigs and cattle, both. Well, we've got to start making sure that the animals that we breed for pets, for food, and laboratory, the animals are not abnormal. You overselect for any trait, you are going to go into abnorm abnormalities. There's a leg selection chart there for pigs. You can get that off a of National Hog Farmer magazine, you know, leg conformation chart. It's free online. Um, you know, these are different defects. You know, there's corkscrew foot in cattle. That's a genetic defect that just started showing up. This guy's really pretty blue eyed, but these, a lot of these animals are deaf and have neurological problems. Not nice. And uh, this is a pig, um, one of those the genetic line of really aggressive pigs, and another pig ate a Sears. Well, a lot of these pigs now, people have gotten rid of them, <laughs> rid of this genetics. Yeah, and then you read, you know, monstrosities like that that have to cab by cesarean section. There's a really gigantic, huge German pig. Just got to show you my freak show. Then you got the Chinese pig. She's all reproduction and no meat. OK, there's trade-offs in genetic selection. I thought this was a very interesting experiment in science. They were looking at Scottish wild sheep. And the ones that had a strong immune function had, were less likely to have twin lambs. And the ones that had twin lambs had a lower immune response. You see, everything takes energy. People think they can go in and biotech their way out of this bull. You can't override physics. It takes energy to make meat. It takes energy for reproduction. 
It takes energy for the immune system. In the dairy cow, for example, production's gone up like this. Reproduction has gone down like this. And then if you feed it very expensive stuff, you can bump it up just a little bit. You might try to select for all those traits. You won't be able to feed it. It won't be able to eat enough. There's another weird pig. All right, let's bash dogs. There's some real monstrosities out there. Now there's the old type bulldog. What about this freakasoid? How do we get into this? If it gets any more folds, it's going to suffocate. <laughs> now the white, now somebody thought that statue was a dog, so I better, like, the white animal there is the dog. But that's the 1938 vision, version. He's actually got legs and a snout compared to this monstrosity where they just over-select it. It can't breathe, it can't walk, and it can't have its babies naturally. OK, looking at some things on body posture. You see that night on the animals in translation, that nice, relaxed, open mouth? That's very relaxed. If you have dogs and they're in that relaxed position. The other dog there, I'm not going to say he's scared, but when they, when they put the mouth up like that, they're getting you know, more vigilant, just a little tiny bit anxious. And, but you get that really nice um, kind of little half open mouth like that, the, not panting, you know, not hot and panting with the tongue way out. That animal's very, very relaxed. Uh, Patricia McConnell has a really nice book on, on dog emotions with a lot of very nice pictures that would be very good for people to have. And there's my genetics and domestic animals book right there. And I got a farm animal book on improving animal welfare, practical approach. Because my approach is how do we bridge the gap between a lot of the great scientific research that's going on out there and the field. This is something I try to do. It's not always an easy thing to do, but I do try to do it. And we have a little bit of time here for questions. I got five minutes. I'm going to pick somebody. <laughs> OK, back there. Is there any way to decondition an animal that has a fear response? First thing you've got to do, if you can figure out what it is he's afraid of. This is where you know, I find I have to do a lot of troubleshooting. And if I can remove that thing, let's say it is a lab coat, for example, I can, let's get rid of the lab coats. You see, that's the easy fix. But if you have a high-strung animal that's, uh, let's say, if, and you don't know what's setting it off, they can be very difficult to decondition. And the more high-strung the temperament is, the harder. Now, one of the things you want to try to do is turn on the seeking system. Because remember on that teeter-totter, turn seeking on, that helps to reduce fear. But it has a way of kind of flashing back. It can be very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to totally get rid of those things. Like this dog that fell off the boat. I mean, it's now totally a grown-up dog. If they take it to the beach, it will dabble in the water. They've never been able to get that. It's a German Shepherd, uh, you know, kind of a large breed cross. And it's terrified of water. Now, they haven't really worked really hard to try to decondition it. But I, you know, its first experience with water was falling off a boat, slipping and falling, and it went in the water. It was nine months old. It can be, it can be really hard. Um, now, sometimes, uh, see, the first thing you got to do when you troubleshoot is be more specific. Okay, what, okay maybe we could start the troubleshooting process. You gotta get okay, what kind of animal is it? Okay, a little girl threw sand in his face and now he's scared of little kids. So the fear memory is probably, you know, the size of the person. And that's and and you can work on deconditioning of it. It's not easy. This is why we gotta have the emphasis on not letting these bad fear memories get started. And so the first time you introduce puppy to little children, we've got to make sure children don't manhandle it and maul it, that they're gentle with the little puppy. Also, it's extremely important to teach dogs about little children. Otherwise, you could get a dangerous prey drive going towards little children because they, they, won't, uh, they won't be people. You know, little puppies have to learn, especially things like Rottweilers, they better learn that toddlers are people too. And you want to make sure that that's a pleasant experience. And I bet you it was the first experience or a very early experience with children. It was puppy. OK, that's the problem. And, and so then and you've got a fear memory there. If a child's like twice as big, it's probably all right. 
You can work on desensitizing it. The problem with these fear memories, you can make it better, but it's, impossible. it's like post-traumatic stress in veterans. You can do things to make it better. Now, the Army right now has been working with beta blocker medicines like propanolol and get the veteran uh, dosed up on propanolol and then replay the, the memory. You know, and then when you take it out of storage, maybe strip off the emotional memory. Uh, but it's difficult. Okay. Well, then, okay, uh, the question was, I want to repeat it for the camera, was you got some pigs in your lab that are very super exploratory, they're all over your boots and everything, and, and um, in, in some of these pigs, I've had some of these pigs commercially, um, they'll actually bite your boot and rip it. They're like starving for stimulation, and, and unfortunately, the type of pig that tail bites too. Yeah, they're a um, certain particular type of lean hybrid, um, and and other pigs that come up nibble at your boots. These guys, uh, the best thing you could do with them is like give them straw. The kind of enrichment they need is straw. They need fibrous things that they can destroy. Uh, where they've got stuff they can just chew up and destroy. And I actually did my thesis um, on this and I talk about this in Animals Make Us Human. I talk about um, uh, uh, and the animals make us human. I talk about pig experiments. And I found if I put straw in for my pigs, and they were the type of real aggressive, you know, chewers, I, once they got the straw chewed up into little bits like this, it was no longer interesting. And then I put a fresh flake of straw in, like big long pieces in it, they were all over it. So I think one of the best things you can do, uh, first of all, try to avoid buying that, particular, uh, buying that type of pig. There are definite differences in fighting, <coughs> the tendency to want to just, you know, bite boots and things like that, attraction to novelty. And if you got those kind of pigs, you need to just be putting new straw in there every day so they always have got something to chew up. You know, then I did a little choice test of, of things to chew. So I had a hose hanging down, a rubber hose, I had a cloth strip hanging down, and I had a chain hanging down, and they were connected to little switches with, to a counter. Uh, the, cloth, the things they could destroy, like the hose and the cloth, were definitely preferred over the chain that they couldn't chew up. They want stuff they can chew up, and that will help reduce some of that behavior. Because I also found, when I had that kind of pig, I had some of them housed in plastic pens, and when I went to clean the pens, they were stimulus starved. They were biting at the hose and biting at the water. I go to clean the feeder, and they're like this all over me. And then my outdoor pigs, where they had fresh straw every day, Plus, I gave them other interesting things to tear up, like phone books. Um, when I went in to clean the feeders, I could just push them away. And they weren't like this, just all over me. So um, this kind of pig needs a lot of um, environmental enrichment, stuff it can just chew up. I know, stuff that clogs drains. That's what they need. And we'll end on that. Thank you for coming. <laughs>